Okay, thanks, Jenny. Um, yeah, I'm Hilton Death, and um, our topic today is stability and spoilage of lipids in, in milk and dairy products. Uh, now, just as a bit of an outline, a little bit of background, and what I, what I want to do in this, um, this webinar is something that I haven't done before and I haven't seen done before, and that's to, I guess, juxtapose lipolysis and oxidation, the two things that, that can occur uh, in fats or lipids, as we call them. And so I, I'm going to make some comparisons between the, the two types of um, uh, degradation, I suppose, of, of lipids. Um, just a bit of background. Um, of course, we know milk's a biological material and um, it degrades as soon as it's, it leaves the cow. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the cow keeps it there at, um, at body temperature and it doesn't go off, which is, um, which is a, bit of, a bit amazing, really. Um, the main components, apart from water, of course, are the, the fats or lipids, as we call them, uh, carbohydrate, of course, that's almost all lactose, and protein. Now, the, we know a bit about what happens with proteins and, and lactose if we, if we keep milk for some time. The proteins get hydrolyzed to peptides, and some of these are quite bitter and give a bit of flavor, and some produce quite rotten sort of flavors in, in, um, in pasteurized milk as it goes off. Of course, the lactose breaks down to, to lactic acid and that, that causes the sour flavours, which, of course, is used to advantage in, in a lot of products, but it's not what we want in something like a, a pasteurised milk. So what happens to fat is what I want to talk about today. Um, so a little bit about fat degradation. Um, the fats really are susceptible to, to these two types of degradation. Lipolysis, which is a hydrolysis reaction, reaction with water, and oxidation, which is um, a reaction with oxygen. Now, both cause off flavours, and um, these are both often described as rancid, but um, lipolysis gives what we call hydrolytic rancidity, and oxidation gives oxidative rancidity. Now, these two off flavours are, are chemically quite different, but they're sometimes confused. So sometimes people talk about a rancid flavour, and they talk about it you know, being oxidized, and then they say, well, it's got a high free fatty acid level or something like that, which is um, a confusion. So hydrolytic rancidity is caused by free fatty acids, which are released from the, from the fats. Oxidative rancidity is caused mainly by aldehydes and ketones and things like that, which uh, are breakdown products of, um, of the oxidation reaction. So... A major difference between hydrolytic and oxidative rancidity is the, is the way the, the flavour compounds are formed. The lipolysis is, is almost completely um, uh, caused by enzymes, um, lipases, and oxidation is caused by a chemical reaction with oxygen. Um, very little oxidation seems to be caused by, by enzymes. <clears throat> um, but there are some similarities between lipolysis and oxidation, as I hinted before. Both can occur spontaneously on the farm in the milk from some cows, and both can be induced after the milk leaves the cow by certain, certain uh, factors. Now, just how all these happen and what we can do about them is what I, what I want to talk about. So let's start with lipolysis. I'll, I'll go through some bits on lipolysis, and I'll talk about oxidation uh, at the end. So... As I said, lipolysis is the hydrolysis of lipids to produce free fatty acids. It's caused by lipases, and the lipases act on the fats, which are mainly triglycerides, and this is a major type of fat in milk. Probably 98% of the fat is triglycerides, and these, these fats have three different fatty acids on them, and they're attached to a, a glycerol background, and it's the lipases that remove one or more of these fatty acids. Now, my little friend at the bottom here that I took out of the dairy, dairy handbook, you can see the glycerol background, uh, backbone. You can see the fatty acids have been released here. Uh, they're free fatty acids, uh, and one's still on there. Now, this little lipase man has chopped off two, so he's left with a what we call a monoglyceride, one with one fatty acid on it. Um, There's another little diagram here. It does says much the same thing, except... This little lipase has chopped off the other uh, two, two different um, fatty acids. Um, now, the products of the lipase are, as I said, free fatty acids, but also these partial glycerides, these bits that are left behind. This one here is a monoglyceride, 
But if we only took one of those, those free fatty acids off there, we'd, we'd have a diglyceride if it's got two fatty acids on it. And the, their claim to fame is that they're, they're surface active. And as we'll see, see later on, they, they affect the foaming of, of milk, um, which is all important when we talk about, about cappuccino coffee. The fatty acids, um, particularly the short chain ones like the butyric and, and um, caprylic, um, they cause off flavors. And sometimes we call them soapy, butyric, rancid, unclean, bitter. Um, they can be quite smelly. If you've ever had um, a bottle of butyric acid and, and opened the lid, it's, uh, it's very, very pungent. Um, so a very small amount of that uh, gives you quite a, um, quite a, a, a um, off flavor. <clears throat> and as I said, the partial glycerides, the other bits are surface active uh, and reduce foaming. So the lipases, what, what sort of lipases have we got? Well, there's two different types and I'll talk about them separately because they, they're very different animals. Uh, the natural milk lipase um, is present in all raw milk. In fact, there's quite a lot of it there. Um, as, I'll, as I'll say a bit later on, um, uh, if it wasn't for the milk fat globule membrane, all our milk would go, go rancid in a very short time after it leaves the cow. So there's a lot of it there. Now, bacterial lipases, um, that's ones that are produced by bacteria that grow in the raw milk during cold storage. Uh, they don't produce a lot in terms of uh, quantity, but they can have a, um, a big effect. Now, the next point is particularly important that um, the milk lipase is destroyed by pasteurization. If that wasn't the case, all our milk would be rancid, and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. The bacterial lipases, um, uh, they're the ones they survive pasteurization, but they can even survive UHT processing. Uh, that's about 140 degrees for around about four seconds. So they're a real problem if we, if we look at um, long life products. The milk lipase is really a problem in raw milk and pasteurized milk uh, because it can cause what we, call, what we call spontaneous or induced lipolysis. And I'm going to talk about those two separately. The bacterial lipases are more of a problem for the long life products, UHT milk, um, even, even cheese and, um, uh, and maybe um, full cream milk powder. So spontaneous lipolysis, um, this is what happens on the farm. It doesn't happen in the factory. It happens on the farm in the milk from some cows, not all cows. Um, and it's when the, when the milk is cooled to, to less than say 10 degrees, left refrigerated, Overnight, I've got overnight there. That's what happens if you if you happen to take this milk in, in the evening milking. Of course, if you leave if you take it in the morning milking uh, for several hours in in the uh, refrigerator, it'll it, um, it'll be um, lipolyzed. So it occurs more in milk from cows in late lactation. Those on poor quality feed. So you can see if you've got both those things happening at the same time, then you, you're likely to have problems. And only in certain cows. So the reported instance is only is up to a third, which um, seems like a, like a fair bit. Um, and some herds, um, it's much more prevalent than in, than in others. And, and I'll mention something about that soon. Um, so the amount of lipolysis produced in a spontaneous milk can be very high and, milk to, and make the milk quite undrinkable. So it's, um, if we had all cows that produced that milk, we'd have some uh, fairly rotten milk. But there's one thing that saves us, and that's that if we mix some of this, what I call spontaneous milk, the milk that spontaneously lipolyzes, with some of the normal milk, which doesn't normally do this, the lipolysis is greatly re reduced, more than what you'd expect from just mixing those two, two milks together. So we've got what I'll call spontaneous and normal cows, and um, you can identify which ones that which ones are normal and which ones are spontaneous by uh, the milk they produce um, uh, throughout, throughout a lactation. And what we find is that some cows are always normal. Uh, I remember doing some work at a farm where there was one particular cow we called a Patsy. She never produced um, spontaneous milk. It was always very, very normal. Some are always spontaneous. And then you've got the others that are only spontaneous at the end of, end of a lactation. 
So it's a bit of a mixture, but um, I guess the, the ones that are always spontaneous are the ones that we've got to look out for. So why does it happen? Um, I guess, to be honest, we don't know completely. Um, a partial answer has come up recently, um, and it's in the genes. Um, it's something that um, we've suspected for a while because in some of the work that we've done, we found that the milk from, um, from cows from certain sires, certain bulls, uh, were more susceptible to this problem than others. Of course, trying to sort that out um, um, in a research project is um, a very large project. It was well beyond our resources. You need a lot of bulls and a lot of, a lot of heifers from, from those bulls. Um, so it's a lot of work, but um, what has happened is um, in, in France, they've um, done some work on this as well. And they found that there's a, uh, an enzyme linked with uh, milk fat synthesis. So it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, diacylglycerolase transferase. Basically, it's um, doing exactly the opposite of what um, lipase does. It's, it's putting a free fatty acid onto a diglyceride. Um, and it's just called DGAT1. And so there's a link between that particular gene and spontaneous lipolysis. So as, as you know, with a particular gene, you have different genotypes. Um, and this one they have, uh, it's got three different genotypes. You can have a KK or a KA or an AA. Just think of the blood groups like A, B and AB as a, as a sort of a comparison uh, of what these genotypes are, are about. Um, now, it turns out the milk from the KK cows to the highest level of spontaneous lipolysis. So, so you might expect that um, if, if you wanted to reduce the amount of spontaneous lipolysis in your herd, you'd go for all KK cows. Now, just keep that in mind as we go, go through and uh, talk about um, oxidation later on. So how is spontaneous milk different from normal milk? Um, it turns out that there's basically three factors that affect the amount of lipolysis uh, that, that occurs spontaneously at the farm. One's the amount of enzyme, but as I said before, the, um, all milks contain more than enough um, lipase to, to, uh, to make a milk go rancid under the right conditions. So one of the other possibilities is that the, the milk fat globule membrane might be a bit fragile at times or in certain, certain uh, uh, the milk from certain cows. Um, and the other one, and it's an important one, is that all milk contains some factors which inhibit the lipolysis and some which activate the lipolysis. So it turns out um, the amount of lipase is, oops, sorry, the amount of lipase is, is not, not a particularly important factor. Uh, the milk fat globule membrane uh, it certainly protects the fat normally, um, and it can become less protective at the end of lactation. So some of the problems at the, um, in late lactation could be due to that. But what, um, what's been found, what we found and what other people have found is that there are certain activating and inhibiting factors in the, in the milk. Um, and it's a balance of those factors which determine whether or not you've got um, a spontaneous milk or a normal milk. If you've got lots of inhibiting factors, you've got a normal milk. If you've got um, a lot of um, activating factors, you've got a spontaneous milk. And um, we found that when you mix normal and spontaneous milk together, uh, we know that reduces the lipolysis. And that's because you're increasing the amount of uh, inhibiting factors uh, in, that, in that milk and preventing the lipolysis. So that's, that's pretty, pretty important that um, we've got that balance right in, in our milk. If we didn't have that balance right, then uh, we'd have a lot, of, uh, a lot of rancid milk. Okay, let's talk about induced lipolysis. Um, when we do something to the milk to, um, to make it um, go rancid, if you like, or hydrolyze. Um, so what we're talking about is really subjecting the milk to some sort of um, physical action um, to, to damage the milk fat globule membrane. And classic ones are pumping uh, or agitation and frothing. If you had some raw milk and you wanted to, to test that out at home, uh, just put it into a a blender um, and blend it up for a, for a while, and then leave the milk on the bench and come back in a half an hour, and you'll 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 um, you'll see what um, lipolysis is all about. It it, um, it doesn't take long to to get quite a smell and um, and quite a taste. Um, so it's all due to damage of the milk fat globule membrane, and once you do that, 
the, the lipase, which is in the, the serum of the milk, in the skim milk, uh, can access the fat. It can happen either at the farm or the factory. And I guess the, the one at the factory is the one that um, a lot of the industry is interested in. At the farm, it, it can certainly happen uh, at the teat cups. Um, if you get air intake uh, at the cups, you, you know that they're, the, the cups are, uh, work under vacuum. So if you have a, a, a leak there and you're getting air intake, uh, that causes bubbling and foaming. And particularly if you've got lines that um, go from the, from the udder of the cow up, um, so they're the raises, if you like, um, the milk can surge up and down in those, those pipes and um, form a foam. And as soon as you get a foam, that's when you, you can start getting uh, some uh, damage to the milk fat globule membrane. That's because the, the foam particles, the, the foam bubbles, interact with the fat and where they interact with the fat globules, they can, they can tear that membrane apart and, and allow the, the lipase access to it. So, so it, you, can, you can get um, agitation of milk without foaming, um, and it causes very little lipolysis, but once you get um, some foaming there, uh, that really increases the amount of, of lipolysis you get. In the, in the factory, of course, you can get uh, situations where you've got faulty seals on pumps and uh, and, and that sucks air. And once it sucks air and it's pumping, it'll, it'll foam and you'll get the same sort of effect as at the farm. It can also occur where you've got milk being pumped over long distances and um, uh, in narrow pipes sometimes um, with multiple bends or elbows. Uh, some of these, um, some factories, there's uh, very long pipelines uh, uh, where this, um, where you can get some problems um, uh, and the milk fat globule membrane can be damaged. And the last bit on that page is probably the one where uh, it's um, the most efficient way of, of getting some lipolysis, and that is if you homogenize raw milk. Now, fortunately, when we, when we pasteurize uh, milk, it kills the lipase. So it doesn't matter what you do after that stage, you're not going to get uh, milk lipase induced lipolysis. So, when milk is homogenized in the factory, uh, it's either done immediately before pasteurization or it's done after pasteurization. If you leave it too long after you homogenize, uh, you'll get um, a very rancid um, uh, milk very quickly. <clears throat> and related to that is mixing homogenized pasteurized milk with, with raw milk. And that's a good way of, of um, causing lipolysis. And, and a lot of people, when they want to demonstrate um, what, what a, a lipase flavour tastes, tastes like, um, they mix some homogenised pasteurised milk with, with raw milk. Um, it doesn't take long. If you, if you mix it one to one and leave it on the bench for half an hour or so and come back, you, you'll, um, you'll start to, to see a, a flavour change. So I just repeated there that mixing raw milk and homogenized milk in a factory is a really big, big no-no. And it's something that could be quite easily done by people who don't, don't understand about lipolysis. And to give you an example of that, some years ago, um, there was an issue in, a, in the milk from a, a major uh, capital city um, factory. And it turned out that the, the milk that they were using had been transported from a regional factory where they had pasteurized milk and they had some pasteurized milk left over at the end of the day and they were sending a tanker to the, the capital city. They threw the, the uh, pasteurized homogenized milk in with the raw milk to send it off. And of course, when, when it got to the, the capital city and they, well, it was after they pasteurized it that they realized that um, that milk was not good. It had a very high level of uh, free fatty acids. It had a level of nine and I'll come, I'll come to in a minute, just what, what that means. So how do we measure the amount of lipolysis? Well, I guess I've hinted at that enough. We, we measure the amount of free fatty acids that are produced. Now, there's a lot of um, chemistry methods that are, that are available for doing that. They usually involve some sort of extraction of the fat and the fat contains the, the, the free fatty acids. And then those uh, free fatty acids are titrated with with an alkali, something like potassium hydroxide. Because um, there are instrumental methods available, um, gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, infra infrared analysis. So um, 
they're becoming much more um, uh, prevalent now than what they, they were some time ago. So what levels are good and what levels are bad? Um, the level of free fat acid in the good quality milk is less than one. So as it leaves the cow, um, it will normally be uh, much below one, maybe something like uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Um, when the free fatty acid reaches about two, most people find that the milk is unacceptable. Um, i just tell a story about that. I had a colleague um, one time who had um, no, no sense of, um, uh, of, of rancid flavour. He, he, um, he, he could drink milk with a very high level of free fatty acid and it, it didn't worry him. Whereas other people are quite um, susceptible to, to quite a, a small rise in free fatty acid. Also, when the, the uh, FFA uh, level reaches two, it, it, the milk is um, has poor foaming properties, so it doesn't doesn't foam very well when you um, uh, blow steam into it. Now, the free fatty acids are important in in the flavour of cheese, and I I put this in just to to say that not all free fatty acids are bad, or, or not all lipolysis is bad. In fact, some cheese varieties rely completely on lipolysis for for their, their characteristic flavour. And I've just mentioned some of them there, Parmesan, uh, feta, blue vein uh, cheese. They all have high levels of free fatty acids normally. Even in some other cheese varieties like, like cheddar, um, free fatty acids contribute to the flavour, uh, to the normal flavour, the acceptable flavour. But if, they, if they're there in excess, then they'll cause a rancid flavour. And, and in most cases, that, that cheese would have to be discarded. Now, I just want to talk about, um, about uh, frothing and, and cappuccino, and I thought I'd do this with a, with a figure, um, and I'll just explain what the figure's all about. On your y-axis, you've got the steam frothing value. So that's, um, that's how much foam you get compared with the milk when you inject it with steam, like you do when you make a, a cappuccino. And along the, the x-axis, you've got the free fatty acids. So it goes from 0.5 up to 3.5. Now, what we did in this, this case, we, we had a milk with a free fatty acid level of 3.5 and we had one at 0.75 and we mixed them in different proportions to give us those, those different, um, uh, different, different levels of free fatty acid. And you'll see that as we increased the amount of free fatty acid, the steam frothing value went down. Um, just, just to explain, a, a free fatty acid value of 100 means that um, we've got 100% foam compared with our milk. So the milk, milk volume and our foam volume are about the same. Now, the other thing in, in this one is that after pasteurization, we get a quite a, a, um, an improvement in our, in our foaming capacity, which I, I guess is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty um, favorable for our, for our industry. And um, just to give you a bit of an idea, this is from uh, one factory that, that gave me their data for a whole month, a whole whole year, and um, this is the the, the uh, steam frothing value for raw milk and for pasteurised milk. So you'll see at any time the pasteurised milk has a higher higher um, foaming capacity than um, than the raw milk. In some cases, it's a it's a it's a huge amount. So in um, in lots of cases, it's made a a marginal milk into a, an acceptable milk. That's all I'm going to say about frothing today. It's a, it's a, it's quite a big topic to to go into, but I, I just wanted to put it in perspective in terms of uh, lipolysis and free fatty acids. Now, the last um, bit of about lipolysis is to do with uh, bacterial uh, lipolysis, and these lipases are, are produced in the raw milk by what we call psychotrophic bacteria, the ones that will grow at low temperature. These are mostly Pseudomonas species. Um, so they're growing there in the milk before we pasteurize it. They've got to get to about um, a million per mil before we start seeing, uh, seeing much lipase being produced. But once the lipase is, is produced, it's, um, it's not destroyed by pasteurization and it even survives uh, some UHT heating. So that's where our problem comes from. And an, another thing about um, bacterial lipases compared with milk lipase is that the milk fat globule membrane is no barrier to them. Uh, you remember I said the, 
the milk fat globule membrane stops the milk lipase from acting on the fat and normally. Well, if we've got um, bacterial lipases there, they don't care about the, the membrane, they, they just go straight to the fat. So the amount of bacterial lipase is always very small um, compared with milk lipase, which, uh, which is there in, in abundance. But you don't need very much lipase to cause a problem when you keep your, your, um, uh, your milk or, or some other product at room temperature for several months. I mean, with UHT milk can be kept up to 12 months. So um, 12 months at room temperature, that's, um, that's, that's enough for lipolysis to, to cause off flavours. So as I said, it, it normally affects long life products like UHT milk, milk powder and cheese. And, and there have been instances um, uh, of cheese, um, whole, whole batches of cheese being thrown out because of, um, because of uh, lipolysis. Of course, the only way to, to really avoid bacterial lipolysis is to prevent the lipase production in the first place. And the only way to do that is to make sure that the milk has a, a low bacterial count. You certainly want to get to, you don't want to get to um, near a million per mil. Okay, that's all I want to say about lipolysis. I'll get on to the second part, and that's about oxidation. As I said, this is quite a, a different issue from, from um, lipolysis, although they do sometimes get confused. Uh, it's been a, an issue in the dairy industry for a long time. Um, I might tell you that when I first started working in dairy research, the first job I got was, um, was working on oxidised flavour in, in, um, in butter. So... And I couldn't believe at that time when I when I read the literature how much work had already been done on on the uh, the area. So it's been around a long time and it's caused caused issues for a lot of people. Um, so the the flavour is often described as cardboardy or metallic, fatty, oily, fishy, stale, and of course rancid. Uh, it involves the addition of oxygen, as I've mentioned, and that oxygen is added usually to almost always to double bonds in fat. So I hope you, um, you, you remember a bit of your chemistry about double bonds. Um, that's ones that have um, missing a couple of hydrogens. Um, so overall, it's the unsaturated acids that are, are to blame for, for the oxidation and oxidized flavor. Now, milk has only about, um, and it's the polyunsaturated ones which are the worst because uh, they're more susceptible to oxidation. But of course, milk's only got about 3%. Of, um, of these polyunsaturated acids. Now, this little, this little table just shows you the difference in, in how fast oxidation occurs in the different, um, uh, different types of uh, fatty acids. So stearic acid, which has got no double bonds, say it's got a, a, a rate of one. Oleic acid with um, one double bond, it's 100 times um, uh, more reactive. Linoleic with two double bonds is 1,200 times more active, and linolenic with three double bonds is 2,500 times more active. So you can see it's those, those, um, uh, those polyunsaturated ones which are, are the most, um, uh, most problem. So why does, why does milk readily oxidise when it only contains about, well, it's about 3% of, um, of polyunsaturated fatty acids? Two, two reasons. One is it's got a fairly low level of antioxidants, um, and the main antioxidant is, is alpha tocopherol. And if you have a look at the picture there, you'll see the the, um, the yellow colour. Oh, sorry, I'll get on to the next one. Um, alpha tocopherol, vitamin E, and that's one of our inhibitors. So, in um, to try and sort of juxtapose it with lipolysis, uh, where we talked about inhibitors and activators, our inhibitor here is. Um, vitamin E, alpha tocopherol, and, and our activators are, are things like riboflavin, which is the, the green yellow color you, you get in whey, and that's what's in this bucket here. And there's also some chlorophyll uh, compounds there, which can also activate the, um, the, the oxidation. So how does, it, how does this oxidation happen? Well, it, um, as we say, it's, it's the addition of oxygen to the double bond. It's a, it's a free radical reaction, but all free radical reactions have, some, have to have some sort of initiation. Um, once they're initiated, they, they, um, they start a chain reaction or a propagation reaction, 
and at some stage there's the um, the steps are uh, are terminated by a terminating step. So the initiation is commonly by light um, in conjunction with photosynthesizers like the riboflavin, the, the, the greeny yellow color in, in whey. Uh, copper is a, um, is a major um, activator of, um, of oxidation, uh, as is iron, although iron to, to a lesser extent. So when when um, the oxygen is added to the unsaturated fatty acids, the, the first product, the primary product as we call it, um, and it doesn't have any flavour, uh, are peroxides. And um, some of you will recognise peroxide value as a, as, a, as a measure that's commonly used for oxidation. It's, it, it's a measure of this primary oxidation product. But keep in mind, these are, these are unflavoured, so they're, they're not the ones that we're, we're really worried about. The peroxide value just gives a, an indication of, um, of, of the oxidized flavor that, uh, that might be there. So in the termination step, these peroxide values break down to give a range of um, what we call secondary compounds. And most of these are carbonyl compounds, they're small compounds, and they're flavorsome compounds. And so they're the aldehydes, the ketones in particular. Uh, and they're the ones that um, give our, um, our products an oxidized flavor. Some of the common ones are hexanel and, and uh, malondialdehyde. Now, hexanel is um, pretty commonly measured these days by HPLC uh, or, or uh, gas chromatography. And it's a pretty good measure of secondary oxidation, particularly of, of linoleic acid. The one that some of you will have um, come across though is malondialdehyde, which is measured in the TBA test. So um, that's another common method that's used for uh, assessing the, the oxidation level in, um, in fats. So oxidation affects um, not just milk, but also dairy products, um, things like whole milk powder and butter. Now it's interesting that whole milk powder is usually produced from milk, which is um, quite severely heated, 90 degrees for 30 seconds, a lot more than just pasteurization. And the reason for that is to is that when when milk is heated at that, under those conditions, it it produces a well it it, it develops that cooked flavour which is a sulphuric flavour, and it's really due to production of um, sulphhydryl compounds uh, which have antioxidant properties. So that reduces oxidation during storage. So that's a very deliberate move by the the industry to to reduce the amount of oxidation that occurs. In, milk, in whole milk powder during storage. Oxidation in butter, um, that was a major problem many years ago. Um, and it was almost solely due to the use of copper piping on, on farms. Um, so they used to use what was called a dairy metal in, um, in, in farm equipment. And that was very high in copper. And the copper uh, got into the, the milk, got into the butter, and um, catalyze the, um, the oxidation. So as I said, when I started work, one of my jobs was to look at um, oxidized flavor and uh, uh, where I was working um, routinely measured um, uh, copper levels in, in butter from all the different factories. So like, um, like lipolysis, oxidation can be spontaneous or it can be induced. And if I talk about spontaneous oxidation, it's, it's probably something that's um, not very well known, but um, it's uh, uh, fairly, fairly widespread. So milk susceptible to, to oxidation spontaneously develop the flavor within about 48 hours of milking. So all you gotta do is to milk the cow, leave the, leave the milk and it, um, it will develop. Now, this next section you'll, you'll probably you'll probably recognize um, it's almost exactly the same as what I said, said for lipolysis, um, spontaneous lipolysis, that some cows always produce milk, which is susceptible to spontaneous oxidation. Some cows never produce it. Some cows produce, um, never, uh, sometimes produce such milk. So very similar to, uh, to lipolysis. I don't know that it um, occurs more in late lactation. I haven't actually seen that. And the incidence is something similar to that of um, spontaneous lipolysis. Uh, 23 to 38 was a figure that, um, that I picked up. 
So why do some milks um, oxidize spontaneously? Uh, I guess there's been a few hypotheses. One is that uh, a higher level of unsaturated lipids, particularly linoleic acid, um, high level of copper, and I've mentioned about the, the effect of copper, and a low level of antioxidants. Um, so that's tocopherol particularly. And some cow's diets can, can affect the, the, the um, susceptibility to oxidation. And some of this is due to um, a low level of tocopherol or a, or a high level of, of copper or unsaturated acids. Um, so a diet high in, in alpha tocopherol leads to low oxidation levels and, and that's been proven. There's quite a lot of interest in grass-fed milk these days. So some, some companies are, are really um, into it. Um, and I've got here milk from grass-fed cows may produce milk with lower oxidation susceptibility. I've put may in bold type in, in my copy here because I wanted, wanted to remind myself that it doesn't always occur. What happens with grass-fed um, milk is it tends to be higher in linoleic acid but also tends to be higher in alpha tocopherol. So I guess it's a balance between the, um, uh, the inhibitor and the activator, whether, whether or not you get a, a reduction in uh, susceptibility. Now, some people, and there's been quite a few reports of, of um, spontaneous lipolysis being related to um, an oxidative uh, enzyme, xanthine oxidase, uh, which has fairly wide range of uh, uh, oxidation um, uh, activities. Um, it contains molybdenum and iron. Uh, I think overall it's probably got minor importance, but there's been quite a lot of interest in, um, in that particular enzyme. So when I said that oxidation is only caused by, only chemically caused, um, I omitted to say that um, there seems to be some, some tie up, albeit small, with xanthine oxidase. So as you can see, it's this balance of activating and inhibiting factors seems to be um, seems to apply to, to to oxidation as well as to to lipolysis. And and what about genetic factors? Well, you might recognise some of some of this too. So what happens? Milk from different herds differ in their susceptibility to spontaneous oxidation. So um, that suggests that there's some sort of heritability of this this uh, phenomenon. And I've actually taken exactly the same words here, except I've changed lipolysis to oxidation. So there's a link between this gene responsible for milk fat synthesis, DGAT, um, and spontaneous oxidation. And it turns out the milk from cows, which we milk from cows, with the AA genotype have the highest levels of spontaneous oxidation. So this could lead to the identification of cows that are, that are likely to produce spontaneous milk or milk which spontaneously oxidizes. But of course, um, if we then select for cows that have got KA or KA, K, KK or KA genotypes, uh, you remember that they're the ones with the highest instance of spontaneous lipolysis. So I don't think you can win if you start um, choosing uh, according to, um, to this particular gene. Okay, I'll finish off with on um, light, in, induced, lipoly, induced oxidation, and we're mostly talking about light-induced oxidation. And this has become a, a concern in, in modern times, I suppose, because of um, uh, pasteurised milk packaged in clear plastic bottles and, and stored in, in cabinets um, under bright fluorescent lights. So that's, um, that's a way of um, initiating the, the light-induced oxidation. So you can get oxidation under those conditions in a relatively short time. And there's, I've just put down here some results of one particular study where they, they, they put milk in one of these cabinets under, under UV light. And the, the, um, the flavour score of that decreased um, quite markedly in, in eight hours. But when they put um, foil around the bottles, so the score remained high for um, a, a long time. So you can see that the, the light was obviously the thing having the, the issue there. But I thought this was interesting, the, that the trained sensory specialist can actually pick up a flavour change in milk exposed to UV light in less than, for, or for, if it's exposed for less than an hour. So that's, um, that, that means that um, there's going to be some people uh, who, who will find that, um, that oxidation um, 
very, very quickly. So the flavor is often referred to as light activated. Um, it is quite disgusting. And I put that there purposely. I've got it in inverted commas because that's the, the term that was used in a paper that I read where they, they um, gave it to taste panelists. And the most common word to describe the flavor was disgusting. So I think you get a bit of a message from that. Uh, it's also described as chemical, burnt, scorched, cabbage, mushroom, burnt hair, plastic, burnt feathers. Sounds, sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Uh, if ever you smelt it or tasted it, you'll know exactly what we mean. It, it really is um, uh, quite disgusting. So it has the smell of wet cardboard or wet paper, uh, and it's quite different from, other, from the smell of other types of oxidation in milk. It... Um, some people say it can be severe enough to lead to a reduction in sales of milk. So I think um, as, as an industry, we have to be careful of that. <clears throat> I, I need to, to say down here, though, that um, it's mainly due to fat, fat oxidation, but protein oxidation is also involved. I know this, um, this webinar is not about fat, uh, protein oxidation, but it has to be seen alongside fat oxidation as, as a contributing factor. And of course, as soon as you get... Um, oxidation of protein, you get some, some um, proteinaceous uh, uh, compounds being formed, which have, have quite putrid flavors. So I'm sure the um, protein oxidation is part of the equation here. Now, the um, <clears throat> photosensitization of the oxidation is, a, is an important one. Um, and it depends very much on the wavelength of the light. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we've got a couple of different photosynthesizers in milk, which um, uh, which absorb light at, at different wavelengths. And I've got their riboflavin on the left and the chlorophyll ones on the right. And you'll see that most of them do absorb down in this 400 to 500 uh, region. Uh, and then you've got chlorophyll up here um, also absorbing at the, the higher, higher levels as well. So different, you get different effects under, under different light, light sources. So it would be possible to, to have a light source um, for, for the milk cabinet, which doesn't contain these wavelengths, which um, uh, are most likely to, to sensitize the, um, the rubber flavor and chlorophyll in, in milk. So how do we protect uh, from light, ox light induced oxidation? Well, I guess keeping it in the dark, and that's what I mentioned about putting the foil around the bottles, that's just keeping it in the dark. Or we can incorporate something like titanium dioxide into the plastic packaging. Um, that gives us our white, our white plastics. Um, one paper said that adding 4.3% of um, titanium dioxide was effective. 1.5% was only partially, partially effective. Of course, wrappers on plastic bottles are a good way of, um, of protecting it. And, um, and, and the companies know that that's also useful for product identification and advertising. So... Um, Multi-layer cardboard cartons uh, probably offer the best, best protection, particularly those with aluminium uh, foil layer. And I'll just show you what um, the paperboard carton, paperboard um, packaging um, that's used for UHT milk looks like. Multi-layer, but it's got this, this aluminium foil um, as, as one of the layers. And so nothing, no light is going to get through there, obviously. So the other parts are to, to prevent oxygen um, ingress because um, if you get oxygen, um, you're going to get um, uh, some oxidation. So that's all I want to say. I'll just, um, just recap some of the things I've said that there's two main reactions that um, reduce the quality of our, our fat um, containing products, um, lipolysis and oxidation. Each produces uh, off flavors and lipolysis also reduces foaming. Uh, they're caused by different chemical reactions they can occur spontaneously in the milk on some cows on the farm, um, like and and also be induced by certain factors like physical disruption of the membrane by in lipolysis and light irradiation or or, ox, or copper uh, or oxidation. Both spontaneous reactions may have genetic basis. I think there's still a lot of work to be done in that area, and different strategies are required to minimise the two reactions. So thank you. That's um, I've just put up here little bit of light reading if you've got time tonight. Um, it's a, a, a chapter that, um, that I published last year. So I, I'm sure you'll find that riveting. 
Um, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll hand it back to Jenny and we can organise some uh, right. questions. Yeah, so thanks so much there, Hilton. Um, yeah, that was very, very informative. Um, we have got one question there from Inga. Yeah. Yeah, okay. so if you can read that one out, please. Right. Um, folks, um, yeah, you're welcome. Please type in your questions or if you would like to um, unmute yourself and ask a question once Hilton has finished this one, um, you're most welcome. Thank you, Hilton. Okay, this, this one is, if you don't have access to raw milk direct from farm, can you use cold-pressed raw milk available in retail to mimic, mimic what policies in your one-to-one -one, uh, raw uh, with pasteurised milk? I'm trying to find an easy way to make this defect to train internal employees. You're spot on. You can certainly do that because um, high pressure doesn't um, doesn't destroy the um, the, uh, the lipase in milk. Uh, you'll note that um, the high pressure, the cold cold pressed raw milk is not homogenized. It can't be homogenized because you've got um, live lipase there. So that's a very good suggestion that, that you've got there. You, it will certainly work. Okay, Pratik has put in a question there. Yeah, um, does lipolysis oxidation also change um, the colour of, uh, of liquid milk? Uh, that's a very good question. Lipolysis certainly doesn't, but oxidation can. Um, if um, uh, I, I can't quote you chapter and verse, um, but I'm sure there, um, there, there could be a, a change in colour. Um, it certainly can change the colour of, uh, of butter. I'll just um, uh, give you an example of that. Um, sometimes people have made a, a butter containing um, um, parsley and things like that. Now, parsley has a high iron content, and um, in the in the butter that they made, the the um, the butter had a light white colour around each each of the um, particles of, um, of of parsley because of the iron content and the oxidation. So it had actually bleached the the um, the beta carotene in the in the butter. I know that doesn't answer your question, but I just it just came to my mind. Okay. Um, also, I believe the same phenomenon, phenomenon applies to fresh milk as well. Oh. Yeah. No. Sorry, not fresh no. milk. It would be fresh cream. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I, I'm I'm not sure about the oxidation changing the colour of, of cream. I'd, I'd have to to check up on that one. Is there any treatment to inactivate bacterial lipase in milk? Um, uh, probably a, a very easy answer. No, <laughs> unfortunately, um, once it's there, it's it's there. Um, it doesn't cause huge amounts of problems, um, but if you have um, if you have poor quality milk, then you you're likely to run into a problem. What could be the recommended threshold of dis dissolved oxygen? In milk to minimise oxidation. Uh, look, that's that's a very good question, and I guess that's been looked at, particularly for UHT milk that has to survive for a long time. Um, when when UHT milk is made by um, an indirect um, heating process, it, it, it's saturated with oxygen, and saturation is about nine parts per million. Uh, the um, when it's, when it's made with a direct process where a vacuum um, extraction system is involved, it, um, it has a, a level of around about one. Uh, so it is possible to reduce the level. And when you reduce the level, you can certainly um, uh, reduce the amount of oxidation. What, um, what threshold, um, uh, I, I can't quote your chapter there, but um, certainly, um, uh, saturated is about nine, and um, you probably have to have um, at least that before you start getting some um, some some effect. I would think. Okay. Um, sorry, Hilton. I've got a question for you. Um, just you were talking about different sorts of cows and their genetics. Are there any actual types of cows that 
um, are more susceptible to spontaneous oxidation and lipolysis? Yeah, look, that's that's an excellent question. Um, and the uh, literature is um, uh, is is um, divided on that. There's been re reports saying that um, certain breeds are more susceptible, and then you've got someone else saying that well, such and such is that we've got different um, different breeds are more susceptible. So um, I, I I don't know whether we, we've got got the answer to that. Okay, so there's nothing in particular, though. That no, like, no, it, it's nothing obvious. If there was something obvious, I think we'd know about it. Yeah, okay, Doc. I'm just um, posting in um, the webinar feedback link for today because Hilton would love some feedback on his presentation and um, that really helps with um, our continuing work with Dairy Australia. So if you can copy that link, plus I will also email it to people afterwards. Hilton, thank you so much. Um, there don't seem to be any more questions popping up at the moment. Um, anyway, it was just fantastic. I learned so much myself, I must say. Um, if people have an, any ideas on another topic they might like Hilton to present on, he has many years ago, he did do one on the frothing of milk um, webinar. If you'd like that one again, um, updated that would be could be an option but if you have any suggestions I'd really appreciate them so with that I'll say thank you very much Hilton okay thanks and, Jenny and thanks yeah, everyone yeah. for very for, um, easy to follow yeah really clearly presented so thanks so much okay thank you okay then bye okay right yeah bye